Hello? Is this thing on? It's Sound Booth Theater Live, everybody. And Hi. I forgot to get my laptop. So, Annie, entertain the people for a moment okay, while we wait guys. for Carrie. Okay, hey, guys. Where's my Sound Booth Theater Live? <coughs> Put it on Facebook. I can't oh, see well, anybody. I'm going to grab it for you. Okay. Drag it over there. Hello, Just... everybody. Oh, my water. Oops, that's no, not going to do. That will never do. Right. I'll fix this so you guys can see me better. There, better. So we're going to be reading excerpts from uh, the book I'm currently narrating right now, Cavern of Spirits by Carrie Summers. And I've done two other uh, books before this that are pa all part of the Stonehaven League series. And I think this one is my favorite so far. Um, shit's just get, getting a little more intense, you know. And there's a lot of real world drama interspersed in with the uh, with the game drama, which I really love, which I think always adds nice dimension to a lit RPG book. Um, I am a bit of a Luddite and I'm not sure if I'm looking in the right place to see if people are talking or not, but, um, if you're talking and I'm not responding, it's because I just don't see what you, I don't see who's talking to me, but Jeff will make everything better when he returns with his laptop. Uh, Carrie Summers, are you... Am I making weird noise? I just realized I don't have this closed. Is that better? All right, Carrie Summers. It looks like we have four viewers right now. I wonder, is Carrie one of them? Oh, I know, I'll put these on. Hello, anybody? Okay. So we are just getting back to the office today to the booth because we were what without power like for two so hard. days two whole days we has carrie joined days. us i can't tell i think so i don't know i it says here six viewers but i don't know who they are i told them that you were going to make everything better when you came back you could answer my question. Oh, here. Hi. There she is. Hi, Carrie. Hi. <laughs> I made it. Yay. Did you just get here? Yes. Okay, cool. I just was a bit of a lot. Hi, I Carrie. I was talking. I'm just getting somebody. here as well. Did you just get here? Yes. Annie was the responsible one this time. Hi, Hi Carrie. Carrie. Yes. Uh, is this me going in circles? I think so. Um, if you have the YouTube video open, then you need to mute it. Well, that was that was a little recursive. Sorry. It's all good. It's okay, better. I just need to join from my laptop. Well, I was telling the viewers the. I think it, we we were at four viewers when I was saying it before, so I can I might as well say it again now that we're all here. That this is the third book of the Stonehaven League series that I've am in the middle of recording right now, Cavern of Spirits, and I believe it's my favorite one so far. Um, I think that the drama is just really it's ramping up, and I'm really enjoying the how much the uh, the real world drama has developed in this book. I think that always adds a nice dimension to a lit RPG um, book, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm curious to know which chapters you want me to read, Carrie. And I was thinking, what do you think about chapter thirty? It's a short one, and it doesn't really give a lot away, and it's entertaining. Yeah, let me pull it up. I. Um... Yeah, you I know, know it's been a while. Expect, I was, yeah, I was I telling Jeff today. It's expect I, you to remember you know, each chapter now, and so I get it all mixed up in my head. Oh, I can only imagine. 
Um, so let me open the book. I really like writing the real world stuff. I mean, I, I, I obviously I, I like the games or I wouldn't be writing in this genre, but it's it's nice to to get to throw in kind of some stuff about their the real people and what's yeah. going on in their lives and just make them a little bit more rounded and whole because yeah. I can really relate to them a little yeah. bit more. Definitely. And yeah. <clears throat> And I think that, that yeah, 30 good. sounds good. And then um, there were a couple little outtakes from early that are just more on the humor side that I was thinking, you know, were okay. Um, but honestly, you guys are in the middle of this right now. And I think that whatever you guys think comes the, comes through the best in audio is, is best for the listeners. So. Okay, so 30, and what else? Um, did you have something else you were thinking, Annie? No, no that was uh, nothing in particular, but it's always good. I think that it sometimes can be a good thing to read like the first chapter in a book because it's sort of like written as a, as a way of setting up the book. So that's always uh -huh. a good thing to do. Um, you start there? Yeah, and then we could get to chapter 30 since that's later. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah. And then there... whatever you what little parts I want to do the little parts that you haven't that you're thinking of. They're too. just I'm super right. short. So maybe well maybe we should do the ones you guys the longer chapters and then if there's time. Oops. They're just like little jokes and stuff. Keep closing the book instead of going to chapter one. That's <laughs> right. Okay, so is there are there any new characters for me in chapter one? Um, I don't know. If there are, I'll tell you who they are. I, I it's, it's, you, it's funny. <laughs> like, I can I'm only imagine how how difficult it is for you to remember like where things are in the book, Carrie, because I literally recorded chapter one maybe last week, seven days ago, and I <laughs> don't remember which part that was. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm just looking at it now. I'm trying to. Call. It looks like there's uh, <laughs> real, and you've done him before, the lawyer. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yes. Is, yes. There might oh be yes, I remember new... the scene. I remember the scene. Okay. All right. All right. You ready? I'm ready. Chapter one. Starting to feel like a real town, isn't it? Has Beck? Oh, starting to feel like a real town, isn't it? Has Beck asked waving an arm toward the bustle of Stonehaven. The medicine woman strolled beside Devon, her wrinkled face slightly upturned to catch the sunlight that drenched the village. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just adding sound effects, you know. <laughs> It was just water, y'all. Okay. <laughs> Devin took a deep breath, enjoying the smell of growing grass and cooking meat. Just outside the kitchen building, a boar carcass roasted over a wide bed of coals, fat sizzling and spitting as it dripped from the browning flesh. Peering through one of the open windows, she spotted Tom, the cook, chopping herbs. Her stomach growled in anticipation of, of the evening meal. Each new day brought increasingly delicious concoctions from Tom's stew pot. Not to mention, now that there were regular harvests of vegetables and grains from the small plots they'd cultivated inside, inside Stonehaven's walls, fruit from the parrot-fertilized orchard, and eggs from the chicken coop. Sorry, I don't feel like I didn't read that very well. I just want to go back. Not to mention, now that there were regular harvests of vegetables and grains from the small plots they'd cultivated inside Stonehaven's walls, fruit from the parrot-fertilized orchard, and eggs from the chicken coop, his creations were abundant. For now, the days when Devon worried her village might starve were in the past. Of course, it wasn't just cultivation and chicken rearing that had ended the food crisis, Stonehaven's hunters still weren't able to find enough game, especially for dwarves who insisted that vegetarianism was a sign of a broken mind. For better or for worse, 
In the few in-game weeks since the defeat of Azraxis and her demon horde, the players camped nearby and became an impromptu. The players camped nearby had become an important part of Stonehaven's resource supply. While roving the jungle and grinding out levels, they looted far more meat than they could consume. The chests inside Tom's kitchens were stuffed with steaks brought in by players. Devon shook her head, irked by the dependency. But until Stonehaven had a supply of livestock or hunters of high enough skill to rove far afield, she had to live with it. As she and Hesbeck neared the dwarven area of the village, they stopped to watch a band of players enter through the wicket gate, a smaller door that her fortifications master, Jarlik, had installed beside the settlement's main gate. Devon couldn't help gritting her teeth. Any of those players, without warning, could pull a weapon and, and kill a Stonehaven citizen who couldn't respawn. Sometimes she had nightmares about it. Sometimes she had nightmares about much darker things, too. Her experience as a demon war priestess lurked beneath the surface of her mind, breaking through when she least expected. You'll have to learn to accept them, Hesbeck said, following Devon's gaze. We weren't going to be isolated forever. It's hard not to worry about the damage they could do. Most villagers have no way to defend themselves. themselves. I suppose I don't need to remind you about the only player ever to attack Stonehaven. Devon rolled her eyes, realizing right away that the medicine woman was referring to the period when her subconscious mind had controlled the demon as Raxus. I wasn't exactly myself at the time. Hesbeck chuckled. <laughs> no, I don't suppose you were. Regardless, you were occupied for most of that battle. But I'll never forget seeing those starborn fighting and dying to defend Stonehaven. Give me a whole gave me a whole new view of your kind. Either way, I guess it's a moot point. I can't go without them right now, and I don't and not just because of the food they supply. Hesbeck nodded. I overhear the Starborn talking sometimes. They still believe a force of evil doers will come and that their divine mission is to defend this place and its shrine. It seems Veya has encouraged them by making a few appearances. Devon smirked imagining the goody-two-shoes paladins falling to their knees before some glowing manifestation of the game's creator AI. Of course, she wasn't one to talk, having spent in her entire Relic Online career being guided by the same AI to achieve goals she barely understood. Except instead of a glowing vision of a benevolent goddess, she got a series of sarcastic game messages and an annoying wisp companion. As for the conversations Hesbeck had overheard, None of the neighboring players had mentioned the continued threat to Devon. She felt a pang of jealousy at the notion that her NPC followers knew more about the players' activity than she did. But it was her own fault for being standoffish. Haley had suggested she try to make friends with the newcomers, but Devon hadn't listened to her guildmate's advice. It wasn't like she was a people-hating hermit. It was just... The other players didn't seem to get Stonehaven and its citizens the way she did. Anyway, she had hoped that by putting her head in the sand, she could wait out the situation until the player population forgot about the village. Unfortunately, with Vea handing out divine inspiration, that seemed highly unlikely. Well, it's been a lovely stroll, Hesbeck said with a touch of amusement in her voice. But the others are starting to look a trifle impatient. The medicine woman gestured toward a path that cut through the settlement, across a little plank bridge that spanned the brook, and into a sunny clearing where the rest of the village leadership waited in a loose circle beneath a group of stately trees. They didn't look all that agitated. The couple, the dwarf couple, Dordan and Heldy, were deep in conversation with Emery, the halfling leader of the former refugees. Jarlik seemed to be taking advantage of the alternate advantage on his fortifications. In fact, Greel was the only one who seemed impatient in the slightest, but that was nothing new. If the lawyer weren't scowling and pacing, Devon would be more likely to be concerned. She sighed. 
<sighs> I guess we should get on with it. Cheer up, Hesbeck said. I don't think there's anyone in any realm who actually likes meetings. But the good <coughs> news is, the sooner we start, the sooner we finish. Half an hour later, Devon was watching a butterfly flit around a dandelion blossom when Greel hucked a throwing knife into the trunk of a tree just inches from her head. Hey! she said, scraping her spine on the tree's bark as she sat up straight. What was that for? The man shrugged. Quickest way to get your attention. She glared. Okay, so maybe she'd been zoning out. You have to admit, your accounting reports are kind of boring. He cast her an oily smile. And as I've told you many times, I'm a lawyer, not a clerk. If you find my reports less than engaging, perhaps you could find someone else to gather information on our resources and overall welfare. Devon groaned. She'd hoped to hand off some of the work of managing the village to her advanced <coughs> NPCs. But if it was just going to lead to abysmally detailed reports that took half the afternoon, she might as well go back to staring at her settlement interface for an hour at a time. She yanked Greel's knife from the tree and smirked while she dropped it into her inventory. Hey, wait, he said. That's mine. When we throw knives at our friends' heads, we lose the privilege of carrying blades, she said in her best talking to a preschooler voice. I'll just make Jordan forge me another one, Greel said, looking to the dwarf patriarch for support. Jordan huffed. <sighs> yeah. But then I'd get an earful from our glorious leader for dropping me other work. It's important stuff. The forging of wee fish hooks and the garden holes. Devon rolled her eyes. Yes, the addition of Emery's followers had added to the list of supplies needed by the village. But she hadn't asked him to eliminate all the fun work orders. I said you could make Bodanir a new uh, greatsword just as soon as Bale and Wari have the uh, proper tools. We are simply too civilized to force them to work the farm plots with their bare hands. And you think Boldenir will be happy if I tell him he's got to wait even longer because you took away the whiny man's pokey thing? It's a superior steel knife, Greel protested. Dordan's laughter boomed. <laughs> so easy to rile this one. With a sigh, Devon pulled Greel's weapon back out of her inventory. She flipped it in her grip, caught it by the flat of the blade, and extended it, hilt first. Just don't do it again. <coughs> you could have taken out my eye or something. The lawyer let out a dramatic sigh. And if I were actually that incompetent, it would take, what, five minutes for Hesbeck to fetch a jungle healing potion and put you back together? Just the thought of drinking one of those foul concoctions made Devon's stomach clench. Her upper lip twitched, and she turned to hide her expression from the medicine woman. It wasn't Hesbeck's fault the potions tasted so bad. Unless... Devon inspected the woman out of the corner of her eye. It wasn't like the foul taste was a secret, and there'd definitely been no attempt on Hesbeck's part to improve the recipe. Hesbeck snorted. <laughs> I'm no fool, child. Making medicine taste like vanilla cream? Make medicine make taste like vanilla cream, and pretty soon you've got a queue of injured villagers. <clears throat> Rather see my friends work harder on avoiding getting hurt in the first place. Devon sighed. How did the woman always seem to know what she was thinking? Yawning, she rubbed her forehead. <sighs> Back to the reason we've gathered this lovely afternoon. How about you try sticking to the highlights, Greel? The lawyer glanced around the group in appeal, but even Jarlik crossed his arms as if to deny the request. Oh, fine, Greel said with an overacted with an overacted eye roll. Here is your short version. Our economy is in the trash heap. If we don't get more iron soon, that great sword Bodenir ordered will need to be carved from stone. Wait, what? Devon said. I just saw a group of players coming to trade. That hardly seems like a poor economy. Yes, Greel said, speaking slowly as if she had just a couple brain cells. 
And the only way we can pay them for goods is to send runners to the other shops to orchestrate complicated trades amongst our vendors until we've moved around enough goods to squeeze a coin or two out of our supply. Devon pressed fingers to her temple. I'm guessing that's what you were explaining earlier. It's exactly what I was explaining earlier, he said, voice sharp. Bartering is fine and well amongst friends, but the Starborn insist on using currency. Despite your generous donation to the village treasury, your gloriousness, we simply don't have liquidity. Don't the players use coins to buy things from us? Yes, when they can afford to. But since they've decided it's their divine purpose to camp out in the jungle indefinitely, they aren't coming into new sources of currency either. Some have even shown the goal to suggest that our kind should be a bottomless source of funds. He shook his head and huffed. <sighs> As if we simply conjure gold and silver from thin air. Devon sighed. Of course the players would think that. In every other game she'd played, NPC vendors always had the funds to buy loot from players. The situation inevitably led to inflation in the game economy, regardless of which money sinks the developers put into the design. She'd always disliked that facet of gaming. But now that she had a glimpse of the alternative, inflation didn't sound so bad. And what's this about an iron shortage? Dorden grumbled. Was flattering at first when so many players commissioned me finely smithed blades. A bit less pleasant when I checked the reserve of ingots yesterday. Devon blew through loose lips. Bodanir, one of the dwarf fighters, had been waiting patiently for a weapon upgrade since the battle against the demons. <sighs> is there really not enough for the tools in Bodanir's sword? There is, but barely. And I've orders for chisels and axes and a skillet for Tom lined up behind. Of course, that doesn't even count for Garda's needs. The woman's at the forge eat even more than me, shaping armor plates and knocking the dents out of helms. So we need coin and we need iron. I hate to send the Stone Shoulder Clan I hate to send the Stone Shoulder Clan's wagon and mule team to Elterra City on a trade mission. Dorden's eyes bulged. I'd rather give up my me forge entirely and go look for that ironwood grove you mentioned than visit that midden heap. Then does anyone have a suggestion? With a heavy sigh, Greel rolled his eyes yet again. <sighs> and now we come to the final portion of my report. The recommendations. Devon pressed the back of her head against the tree, the bark's bite distracting her from the urge to groan in dismay. Annie, can you restart from Devon pressed? We broke up real bad, like the internet was pissed at you or something. I'm breaking the internet, y'all. Yeah, sorry. Devon pressed the back of her head against the tree, the bark's bite distracting her from the urge to groan in dismay. Go ahead she said with a false smile. In conclusion, uh, Greel said, I recommend we form a party of qualified adventurers to escort our dwarven brethren who are skilled in the mining trade. This party shall skirt the southern edge of Ishildar, then venture into the mountainous terrain directly bordering the ancient city to the east. Therein, they shall seek deposits of precious metals and iron, and upon discovering said resources, shall endeavor to extract them. All gold and silver shall be minted into coin, and all iron returned for use in the forge. A portion of the calculated monetary value will be dispensed to party members and individuals responsible for resource extraction, payable as a small portion of the minted coin. Devon stared. Tell me you don't really speak like that unless you're trying to annoy someone. The lawyer shrugged. I shall allow you to draw your own conclusions, if you have the deductive capabilities. 
A faint smile tugged at his lips, suggesting that he thought he was funny. So, basically, we need to explore the mountains east of the city and dig a mine or two. Any idea what we face out there? Oh, drakes and wyverns and the like, Greel said casually. Devin nearly jumped up. Really? He sniggered. <laughs> Just kidding. I have no idea. She glared. Well, if it's our best interest solution, if it's our, if it's our best solution to the cash problem, I suppose we should make the time. I was hoping to start searching for the next of this Shildar's relics. The whole point of spending the last few weeks stabilizing and fortifying the village was to free up our fighters for the hunt. As if on cue, a glowing ball descended from the treetops. Bob booped Devin's nose. And what's to say you wouldn't find a relic in the mountains of east of Il And what's to say you wouldn't find a relic in the mountains east of Ishildar? Hi, Bob, she said with a sigh. So were you just waiting to tell me this? Oh, so you were just waiting to tell me this. Why? Bob bounced lightly as if shrugging. As I've said many times before, you didn't ask. You need to be clear about these things. She took a deep breath from getting she took a deep breath to keep from getting annoyed. Fine. Was there a vassal society located in the mountains near Ishildar's eastern border, Bob? Indeed. The wisp cork screwed upward. Okay, what do you think? What do you think we use this as a stopping point? Sure. All right, so, I, I mean, for me, Greel is one of my favorite characters to voice. He's just... I love Greel. He's he's such a crabby bastard. Those are, the, those are so fun. That, those kinds of characters are just so fun I, to play. I find, I find myself strangely attracted to him. Really? Yeah. <laughs> and he's supposed to be, like, he's, like, he's, he's a hunchback, sort of, like, ugly hunchback asshole. And I'm like, mm, hmm, hmm. Mm -hmm. Taking <laughs> he's also not he's also not real but still but still even still <laughs> i i really enjoy it you know with, especially i spent a lot of time writing action and stuff and then i just i have a lot of fun when i get to write somebody like grail who's he's just, he's just annoying and you know thinks so highly of himself but he has a good heart and, I don't know. I, I always have a smile when I get to write him. Greel is one of my favorite characters too. So, uh, what what are what's what would be the next scene that you think would be good for us to do, Carrie? You said you uh, had a few a few picked out. Well, we could do maybe just a short one, and I think any suggestion of chapter thirty with the, a little bit of the okay. real world stuff is a good one. Um, I kind of like when Devin first meet. Well, oh, maybe that's too much of a spoiler. Um, I was thinking when she first meets the 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 dwarf offspring. The Brittany. dwarf offspring. Yeah. Oh yeah. Hmm. Oh, the baby. That's right. Um. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. If, is that too much of a spoiler? It's it's probably not. It's a really it's a small part of the book, um, and it doesn't say anything about the the process. I, I don't know. I don't think it says anything about the the birthing process. Yeah, I don't think so either. Let me see. Oh, yeah. does it? It's in chapter six. Chapter what? Sorry, it's inside it. chapter six, and then I think. Um, It starts at when she, it starts, let's see. Um, you could say, you can search for, she stepped up to the door. She stepped up to the door. That's, let's see, I'm looking at the print PDF. It's like on the fourth page of the print one. She stepped up to the door, tapping lightly. Yeah. Yeah. And that one, it has Dordan, I think has like one line, maybe. 
Yes. So there's a new baby in the village. This is the first time the village has ever had a baby, and it's a dwarf baby. And Devin doesn't know what to expect. Um, and here we go. Well, now I've lost my... Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> is there anything else you want to say about it, Carrie? Oh, me? Sorry, it's hard for you guys. No, no, yeah, yeah. I'm looking right at you right now. <laughs> okay. um, Yo, no, yeah. I mean, they've been... Devin was surprised to learn that they were expecting, and yeah. she ends up a little surprised about the whole process, but we leave that for the yes. listeners later. And so she's just been out. She just got herself a little bit trounced um, out in battle, and then she heard that the babies arrived, so she's come to meet it. Here we go. She stepped up to the door, tapping lightly. Heavy footfalls shook the floor, and the door flew open, exposing a grin so wide Devin worried Dorden's jaw would lock. The dwarf seized her by the arm, yanking her inside, and slammed the door. Devin blinked as her eyes adjusted to the dimness. When her vision returned, she tiptoed forward. Heldy sat in a straight-backed chair, her hair unbraided and falling in loose waves around a linen tunic. The dwarf woman looked down adoringly at the little package in her lap. Devin hadn't known what to expect. She'd imagined the baby would <clears throat> basically be, by, be like a miniature version of the adult dwarves, but without the beard. She wasn't sure what to compare the baby to, but he certainly wasn't what she'd expected. Luminous over a tiny button nose, the child's green eyes were genuinely enormous, like anime-sized. He had an eensy weensy mouth all pursed up in a sweet little pucker. When she drew near, he focused on her and blinked, then made a tiny cooing noise. The miniature dwarf was undoubtedly the cutest thing she had ever seen. Devin tried to look up at Heldy, intent on congratulating her, but her eyes kept returning to the little face. I... Hello, Poochie, she said. What you doing, little cootie? Devin blinked. Where had that come from? She swallowed, unable to wipe the stupid grin off her face. A dwarf baby has afflicted you with adoration. You seem unable to think straight or speak like an intelligent adult while within three meters of the caster. Oh, for crying out loud, Hesbeck's voice penetrated Devin's trance. Someone drag her out of range. We'll never get to see the child if we wait for Devon to remove herself. The baby blinked again, blowing a tiny spit bubble from his perfect little mouth. Devon tickled his tummy and giggled, and he giggled. Who's getting the baby's tummy? Devon crooned. I'm getting the baby's tummy! Hesbeck groaned. Loudly. Dimly, Devin noticed a glow spreading from the entrance to the cabin. A moment later, a chill wave struck and passed through her. Hesbeck has cast inner armor on you, increasing your resistance to, mid -al to mind altering spells. Devin blinked and swallowed. The baby cooed, and she smiled. But the impulse to raspberry the child's chubby cheek was now manageable. Mostly. He's. She trailed off, once again struck by the deep emerald shine of the boy's eyes. Adorable, yes, we know, Hesbeck said, and most of us are smart enough to train resistances before exposing ourselves. The medicine woman sighed, and her stomping feet shook the floorboards. Moments later, her hand latched on Devon's shoulder. Come on, child. Better to take this in small doses until you've learned the tricks of it. Devon shook her head. But he's so... Heldy looked up and leaned around Devon and Hesbeck to catch her husband's attention. Come on, Durden. You've had your fun. Help out the poor starborn friend. With a low chuckle, Dorden crossed the small room and stepped between Devon and his child. Suddenly confronted with his bulbous nose and scraggly beard, Devon recoiled as she as the adoration effect was cancelled. She couldn't help grimacing, which only caused Dorden to laugh harder. 
<laughs> Let's get you out of here, the dwarf said, pushing her by the elbows as Hesbeck tugged on Devon's shoulder. Stumbling, Devon shuffled back. Once the safety of the doorway, she took a deep breath. Well, that was unexpected, she said. I thought he would be... Thought he'd be as handsome as his father. Dorden said, puffing his chest. Someday. What's his name? She asked. Ah, now that's a good question. And it demands a long answer. What do you say we speak of it on tomorrow's trek? For now, I have plenty of eager clan members and villagers who want to see me, boy. I think that's probably a good cutoff point because it starts to get into to some of the other stuff that might be a little spoilery on the side plot. Okay. <clears throat> cool. I was wondering, I was actually wondering how you voice, you know, the. That's just like the over the top, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I basically just did what I really do in the present. <laughs> <laughs> <It's funny. laughs> and not, not me. When I, when I see a baby, I'm like, so. so. <laughs> yeah. How's it going, baby? Yeah. How's your baby been? <laughs> Babies. Fist bump. All right. So, all right. Well, uh, well do we that, have any more? Do we have any more? Uh, any more fun scenes or or scenes where we can in introduce uh, some characters before chapter um, three? We could maybe do. There's the the pal the player paladin. Um, yeah. Thorold, and he he comes into play some in this book and then more in the next, which. Will be coming. Um, he, let's see. Torald, level twenty-one base class, paladin specialization. So the the whole scene where he's introduced is a little long. I don't know if it might. Um, Right, and it gets a little. It looks like he's introduced late in the scene. So yeah, maybe we have a chapter break. Let's see where the chapter break is. Which which chapter are we talking? Um, chapter eight. Um, so the player, a paladin in armor, so polished, he must. It's is that too? Maybe I maybe we need a little bit more. So, okay, basically the villagers are wanting to utilize um, the players that have come and set up camp next to the village. Um, yes. Because they've actually come to help Devin. They're Haley's friends who, that have come to help Devin um, because it is, uh, they, they, they realize <laughs> that there are some jerk players who have found out about Stonehaven because of the nature of how uh, public Haley's profile is. And when Haley came to save Devin, she, she was forced, this is in the last book, Haley was forced to make Stonehaven public, um, which Devin had been trying to not do um, just to keep it protected. But she had to make it public so that a lot of her friends could come and rescue um, the, the whole village and it worked and they they saved Devin from her demon alter ego um as Raxus which is a really cool if you haven't I love that I love that whole part of the second book I really love that um and you should just you should read the book if you haven't um because I think it's probably too much to go into right now but Right. Devin's, well, we have... Devin's unconscious was taken hostage by. Something. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so if you guys want to find out about that, by the way, all the links to the first two audiobooks and, and the Kindle edition of Cavern of Spirits, <laughs> which is the book we're recording now, are in the description below. Yes. Okay. So now. Devin is is wary of these players, but the NPCs are like, let's, <coughs> the, you know, let's give him a chance. 
So she has agreed to sort of like go and be friendly with this player who's offering to help. Out this with paladin the guy. The paladin, yes. And uh, Carrie, what are you what are you hearing for this guy's voice? Um, he's super super role playery, and okay. he's just like he, he's like trying to be like a knight, you know. But okay. he's, he's super over the top. All right, over the top, stereotypical paladin. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. But do you want? Do you want me to? Do you want him to have a bad fake accent or a good? Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. A bad. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. The player, a paladin in armor, so polished he must have shined it at least once a play session, looked askance at Devon as she stood behind Jarlik's shoulder. She smiled, <coughs> kind of, and gestured toward the fortifications master. Jarlik has a quest for you, and I need you to be here to appro- Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Jarlik has a quest for you, and I need to be here to approve it, she said. After an awkward pause, she added, Thanks for helping. The paladin gave a very role player -y bow. I figured as much, considering there's a quest pop up in front of my face. Devon contained her wince, fairly. Okay, so no more stating the obvious. Small talk. Smile and wave. Sorry, I don't really know how this works. The player smirked. I was just giving you shit. I didn't know your NPCs could give quests either. Devon glanced at Jarlik to judge his reaction. She deliberately avoided calling the villagers NPCs in conversation, and she certainly didn't refer to them as her NPCs. It didn't seem right, considering they didn't think of themselves as non-player characters controlled by a computer, nor as followers slaves to Devon's will. Followers slaved to, to Devon's will. But if the player's word choice bothered Jarlik, he didn't show it. Uh, wait, didn't you guys come asking for tasks? Devon said. We asked to help with the construction because it would help Stonehaven's defense. Getting a quest reward out of it is just a bonus. Devon raised her eyebrow, but Devon raised an eyebrow. Really? They were helping build a village out of the goodness of their hearts? Where had Haley found these people? She wasn't sure what to say for a moment, so she glanced at the sky and started formulating a comment about the weather. Fortunately, Jarlik saved her by clearing his throat. Oh, I'm trying to remember <coughs> how Jarlik sounds. Yeah. Jarlik, Jarlik, Jarlik. He's um, like, a, he's a brawler. Oh, oh, I think I remember. Okay. <clears throat> We are nearly done with the southern half of the moat, if you have any interest in helping there, he said. The player's eyes went distant, likely as a new objective was added to his quest lot dialogue to the quest dialogue. He nodded. Yeah. Devon couldn't help staring and wondering what his motivation was. Then again, what was hers? She wasn't exactly grinding out the levels either. But she was the leader of Stonehaven and champion of Ishildar. Compared to digging a moat for a bit of XP, she was pretty much a power leveler. The player turned back to her. I think this is where you have to approve. As if on cue, a pop-up appeared in her vision. Will you allow Jarlik to be a quest provider for Stonehaven? Accept yes or no. Devon selected yes, then brushed the pop-up away. The player was still staring at her, a faint moon-eyed expression on his face, and she felt the color in her cheeks. It was probably her 37 charisma at work again, though she had to admit that the paladin wasn't hard on the eyes either. For someone whose armor was way too shiny, he had a faint roguishness about him. Of course, as soon as she realized she was even paying attention to that, Devon wanted to smack herself. She was spending way too much time in-game if she was starting to consider other players hot. Hopefully Tamara would take her up on dinner on her dinner on a dinner invitation soon. She needed some real-life human faces. She needed to see some real-life human faces. 
Blinking, she turned her head and pretended to be inspecting something about the village. Jarlik again cleared his throat and nodded. <clears throat> On behalf of the settlement, thank you for your offer of assistance. There were shovels beside the trench, and once you've tied yourself out there... Jarlik paused and looked the man over. Uh, yes, I believe you have sufficient strength. The workers at the quarry have stacks of blocks ready to be carried back. For every five blocks transported, we would reward you. The paladin finally tore his gaze from Devon and peered over the low foundation of the curtain wall to examine the trail leading to the quarry. You know, of the clerics invited, a one of the clerics invited a crafter friend to come hang out at our camp. She's been working on obscure skills to see what's available and is apparently some kind of wheel right now. She made some of us handcarts. Jarlik shook his head. Our dwarven friends learned the hard way how wheels can become mired out here. The jungle might have retreated, but the soil is soft. It's still soft. Crossing his arms, the paladin nodded. What if I were to help out with that? Even with the changing environment, there's plenty of wood we could use to build a plank path. Or if you feel you could spare the scrap stone, we could construct a cobblestone trail. At this, Jarlik seemed to realize the conversation had gone beyond his pay grade. He glanced at Devon expectantly. It sounded like a good idea, actually. She was about to ask the player for his name so she could stop thinking of him as Anonymous Paladin when she realized she could just inspect him. With the NPCs, she'd taken to introducing herself like normal people did in real life. She honestly didn't even know if the introductions were necessary or if they could just pull her name from the digital ether. But they always seemed to appreciate the effort. But the player would think she was really weird. But the player would think she was really weird or hard or a hardcore pl role player. She pulled up his inspection window. Torald, level twenty-one, base class, paladin, specialization unassigned, unique class unassigned, health six hundred seventy-six out of six hundred seventy-six, mana one hundred four out of one hundred four, fatigue thirteen percent. As she flicked the window away, her chest tightened. Did other players see the full details on her character sheet? If so, did they see her shadowed stat too? The thought made her vaguely uncomfortable. Both men were looking at her now, and she hardened her expression as she glanced toward the quarry trail. After a moment, she nodded. It's a good idea. Talk to Deld and the quarrymen, Jarlik. If there's waste stone, Let's go straight to the cobblestone path. Otherwise, planks will be an improvement. She thought about suggesting that the players could improve the path between their camp and Stonehaven as well, but decided that could wait. Just allowing the newcomers to help out with Stonehaven's development was a big step for her. Jarlik nodded and turned to Torald. Come back tomorrow and I'll let you know what sort of construction we'd like on the path. For now... The help on the moat and carrying stone blocks are the only tasks I can offer. To Devon, that sounded like a clear dismissal, but Tyrold continued to stand there. After a moment, he finally caught on and tugged a gleaming helm from a small pouch slung over his shoulder. A trick that made Devon do a double take and inspect the piece of gear. Item, man purse of holding. This delicate pouch is both fashionable and convenient. Tucks neatly under a guild to bard or other heraldly garments, but the chic style also makes it uh but the chic style also makes this man purse ideal for accessorizing the modern warrior's daily wear. Containers Container ten large slots, twenty medium slots, twenty small slots. The paladin noticed the direction of Devon's gaze. Don't even start, he said. It's one of the highest priced items on the European auction house. Devon fought to keep a straight face. It does have a lot of slots. Tyrald's mouth. Tyrald's mouth made a hard line as he waited for the punchline. 
And I like the way it completes your battle regalia, she finished. The man gave her a flat stare. I have a rule. Never carry inventory overflow for anyone who mocks my man purse. Watch yourself, Miss Enhanced Basic Rucksack. Devin smirked. Should make it, oh, sorry. Should make it easy to transport stone blocks back from the quarry anyway. And, and for carrying the spoils of my fight against darkness, he said with a laugh. Charlick was shuffling as if ready for the conversation to be over. He kept glancing at the unfinished curtain wall. Devin patted him on the shoulder, then glanced back toward the wicket gate leading into Stonehaven. I should go finish getting supplies together for the trek, she said. Trek? Tyrald asked. She hesitated, abruptly <laughs> unsure whether she wanted the players to know she'd be gone. Just a little exploring, she said. He nodded. Well, if you ever want to group up with some of us, we tend to meet up at the camp, usually on the hour or out half hour. I'm sure anyone would be keen to see what your deceiver abilities are all about. She blinked and swallowed. Thanks, she said after a moment's hesitation. I, I may take you up on it after this. With a slight bow, the man shoved the helm into his... Sorry, with a slight bow, the man shoved the helm onto his head and glanced at the moat. Seems I have some ditches to dig. Enjoy, Devin said as she turned for the gate into the village. All right. That's the chapter. All right, and then... Okay, cool. It's it's cool that we're getting more player characters in, in this story. I think, I think the yeah. mix between player characters and non-player characters is really essential for making yeah. making things work in lit RPG. So yeah. Yeah. It's also cool uh, how the village is developing. There are mm -hmm. more characters and more structures and it's like the the whole picture of the of the of the village is really coming to life. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I, I keep wanting to I I, I'm always looking for more time, but I really want to do like a really nice map and stuff because it's yeah. you know I've got this all these pictures in my mind and I just want to put more out there. Yeah. Um, Readers love the maps. Oh, I, I love the maps. Yeah. I, I love drawing them, and it's just it's hard to find all that time. All right, so chapter thirty. Are we stop at starting at the top. Yeah, I think because chapter thirty is short. Let me just. Oops. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get there. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Emerson, uh, is the, the software developer for Veya, one of the game's AIs. The game is is made up of two AIs that um, compete with each other and learn from each other. And he's Vea's developer. And the other AI, I'm trying to make, I want to make sure I don't, I'm not giving anything away. So stop me if it seems like I'm saying too much. But um, the other AI is controlled by another developer. And she's doing really shady things that's causing problems for the characters in their real lives. Um, and she was the one, <clears throat> yeah, she's doing illegal things and it's, it's not good. And she has basically gotten to, um, to, uh, Emerson's boss before him and made his boss think that Emerson is like cra losing it and is not credible and needs to take some time off. So Emerson's been having trouble getting to his boss, and because his boss is not a a developer, any he, you can't explain. It's hard to explain to him and have him understand what's going on. So he has had to resort to um, desperate measures, and Devin has gone with him to help him explain to his boss uh, what's going on. So here we are, okay. chapter chapter thirty. The helicopter landed in Tucson at about 11 p.m. 
because it was a small city, especially now that summers often saw temperatures regularly rising above 115 degrees. There weren't many auto cabs stationed near the airport in the middle of the night. <clears throat> Oops. Let me put my phone on airplane mode because I keep getting email pop-ups distracting me. Emerson and Devin waited at the curb for about 15 minutes before their ride arrived. After the conversation in the helicopter, Devin was feeling thoughtful, and she'd never liked making small talk. If her silence bothered Emerson, he didn't show it. Devin liked that, especially since most people seemed to feel the need to blab nonstop. As the cab rolled silently onto the arrivals level, Emerson turned to her. Sorry. Uh, as, oh, um, okay. Amerson, Amerson turned her. Okay. Uh, you ready to go straight into headquarters? Bradley usually works late. We'll have an easier time getting his ear now than when the office is full. Devin nodded. The sooner the better. She stared out the window as the cab navigated sleep, sleepy freeways on the way to the small downtown area. She hadn't had much chance to travel outside the St. George vicinity, but she'd killed a little time now and then on virtual tours. When her Avatharn guild had been waiting on timers to expire before dungeons could be raided, she switched the VR pod over to one of the various travel experiences. Over the five years she'd been a regular pod people customer, she'd visited ancient Rome and Greece, toured downtown Tokyo, and ridden a paddle boat on the Mississippi. But seeing things firsthand was just different. She'd read about the intentional communities on Tucson's outer rim. Unlike Las Vegas's biodomes, which were as much a tourist attraction as anything, the enclosed habitats here weren't created to alter the environment, but rather to exist without burdening it. In Tucson, that meant a closed loop for water recycling inside the structure, <clears throat> plus highly efficient cooling systems. Otherwise, with the native plantings and ordinary-looking public spaces, the communities weren't any different than the condo complexes next door. Still, Devin stared at the installations as they slid past, wondering what it would be like to basically live life and work in a big greenhouse. The Vegas rainforests are much more impressive, Emerson said. Kind of tacky, considering the water shortages, but worth visiting if you've ever wondered what it's like to live in a jungle. Devin couldn't help the sudden laugh that burst from her throat. <laughs> what? Emerson asked. Devin shook her head. <laughs> I guess if I was looking for proof that you didn't spy on my, my character, that establishes it definitively. You visited a jungle in the game, I guess? That's something of an understatement, she said. All too soon, the cab pulled up beside the E-squared office building, Devin took a deep breath, suddenly far more nervous than she'd expected to be. Back when she'd been focused on playing while waiting for Emerson to fix things, it had been easy to forget that there'd been very serious breaches by the company. Even on the flight over, she found ways to distract herself. Emerson had asked more about Tamara, and, had even, and he'd even offered some suggestions on things she could research about her friend's prognosis. But now... She faced the confrontation that could quite possibly end with her barred from RO forever. Worse, their actions could lead to Relic Online's shutdown and the effective murder of everyone in Stonehaven. She clutched her bag tight as the cab door slid open and the AI driver wished them a pleasant evening. Hopping out first, Emerson extended a hand, then withdrew it as if worrying he'd overreached, and then extended it once again with an awkward laugh though Devon would have rather kept her death grip on her bag-turned shield, she accepted the help to spare him any more awkwardness. They crossed the sidewalk to the front doors of the office building, and Emerson held his wrist over the access pad. The speaker crackled, and a red light flashed. Alarmed, Devon stared at him. He shrugged. Figured that would happen, but I had to try, right? Swallowing, she nodded. And so what now? Now, he said, we get Bradley's attention. 
Devin had never seen an image of Bradley Williams, probably because of the incredibly low profile E Squared had kept during development due to their partnership with Entwined. Still, she assumed that the hollow Emerson had projected in the middle of the street was an accurate likeness. At the very least, the rendering had the bearing of a corporate bigwig, right down to the arrogant smirk on his face. Of course, the leotard, tights, and orange superhero cape kind of spoiled the look. After a minute or two spent inspecting his creation, Emerson gave a satisfied nod and tapped on his tablet a few times. A pair of small bots responsible for the projection spidered up the outside wall of the E-squared offices, allowing the projection to lift off from the asphalt and float up to the 10th or 11th level, where she assumed Bradley's office was. Cape flapping, tights glimmering, the image hung in front of the window pane and started pulling out, displaying, and tossing away a set of poster board signs that materialized behind his back. What do they say? She asked. Just reminders of some office Christmas party situations and comments that I'm not, that I'm sure he'd rather forget. And a gentle request that he should hear me out. Not three minutes after Super Bradley began his campaign of persuasion, the intercom beside the front door crackled. All right, and how do you envision Bradley's voice? Have we encountered him before? Yeah, Bradley Did is we? Emerson's boss, the one that's like... Oh, yeah, 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 okay. What the hell, Emerson? Emerson thumbed the button. We need to talk. You're supposed to be on vacation. And instead, I'm here trying to save your company. Our company, the CEO said. I hope you didn't think your complimentary vacation was anything but a chance to relax. It, it will only remain our company if you hear me out, Emerson said. Otherwise, I'll have to resign to protect myself from the mess you created, and I'll need to alert the authorities to certain situations. Devin's eyes widened at this. They couldn't tell anyone anything until Owen was safe. But Emerson cast her a reassuring glance, a reassuring glance. Seemed this was just a tactic. Penelope said you'd gone off course. Bradley said. I thought it was just a simple case of burnout. But clearly, you need a doctor. Emerson shook his head as he thumbed the button. I really would rather not argue about this on a public street. If you're concerned about my sanity, ask security to, to accompany me to your office. Of course, I'd suggest you not ask your security to escort me anywhere else. Your superhero self is pre-programmed to turn up downtown in the morning if I don't cancel the scheduled task. I'll only do that once I've I'll only do that once I've been allowed to present my case. After a long, tense moment, the speaker crackled again. I'll hear you out, but I'm calling enough private security to defend the president. And a shrink. Fair enough? Emerson said. My point should be fairly straightforward to make. I just need you to understand my player here. IT to monitor and interpret network traffic. The end. The end. All right, cool. So, yes, uh, all right, um, I'm excited to get started on the character voices, on the male character voices. I think, Annie, you're what, like almost 70% done now? I'm 75, 76, something like that. I have two. Okay. Yeah, I'll be done so in maybe. a couple days. Yeah, two more days of recording, and then I'll get my character voices on there, and we'll start the editing process. So <laughs> we'll have this out pretty soon, guys. Um, yeah. So I hope this guy got y'all hyped. Carrie, thank you so much for coming and hanging out with thank us. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you. I love listening to you guys do it. And it's so fun to watch, too. I just, you know, when I first um, thought about the narration, I just assumed that you would have to do it in, like, so many passes, Annie, that you'd have to, like, read it and then take all this time to switch yourself over to being able to do the next voice. And it would have to all be recorded separately because I just, it's so far beyond what I can do. Yeah. To be yeah. able to just wait for it is crazy. 
I feel yeah, the yeah. same way about writing a book. So <laughs> we all have our strengths. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I think I think someone without narration experience might do it that way. You know, might uh, might do the narration and then do the characters on the next pass or something because I did do it that way a lot more when I started. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but uh, we started you off with characters and we kind of got you slowly into the narration. Um, so I, I guess that's that's why you were able to transition so quickly. And also, you know, it would take it would take forever to make an oh, audio book if that's how if that's how we did it. And so we we have to manage and figure out how to do it and how to switch back and forth between characters and narration um, without even thinking about it now. So yeah. sometimes I hear you guys' voices in my head when I'm writing now too, which is which is cool. Yeah. Well, Annie's voice is very sweet to have in your head. <laughs> uh, but um, anyway, thank you, got, thank you again. Thank you, everybody, for coming in and watching the stream. Um, if you like the video, please hit that like button. Um, if you're, this is your first time watching the Sound Booth Theater live, be sure to subscribe if you enjoyed it, and hit the bell if you want to get notifications whenever we go live again next. We may have another Sound Booth Theater live this week. Not exactly sure. Um, Justin Thomas James might have something coming up, so just keep an eye out. Um, and a as always, all the all the links to all of our books for this this uh, particular cast are in the description below, as well as all of our Facebook and um, uh, Facebook uh, group links. So um, thank you guys again, and you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you guys. Broadcast. Are you ready? Oh yeah, you stop broadcast. Should I push the button. I get to push the button. You get to push the button. Bye everyone. <laughs>